Amazing. Thank you for the introduction. So, um, so my name's May. I work at the Royal Parks um, and my role previous to this was working at Butterfly Conservation. Um, and so this talk is all about butterflies. So um, I think they're kind of one of the most loved insects um, in the UK. I love them. Um, I've been passionate about butterflies for as long as I can remember. I think a lot of people that are interested in insects, um, when you ask them, you know, why, why, how long and why do you love these? In why do you love this specific group of insects? I think a lot of people just say I, I don't know just it's almost something like you know we're born with this passion um so uh so yeah so my name's may and i'm the engagement officer at the royal parks and so yeah today i'm just going to be telling you a little bit about butterflies going to be um just putting them into context really about you know why they're important why we should um you know all be trying to protect them um and uh, and just looking at uh, their their beauty and their life cycle as well see if I can go to the next slide. Amazing. So insects, the little things that run the world. Um, so at the Royal Parks, my role is predominantly kind of outdoor environmental education. Um, and a lot of what I do is talking to members of the public and community groups about insects and why they're important. Um, I think everyone knows things like bees are important for pollinating and providing us with food. Um, but I think often lots of other insects like butterflies, moths, hoverflies, um, wasps and other kind of fascinating insects often go unnoticed. Um, and butterflies are really important for so many reasons. Um, so just a bit of kind of background information. So butterflies, there are around 59 different species of butterfly in the UK. Um, I always like to compare that to over two and a half thousand species of moth. Um, so actually there's there's not um, not as many butterfly species. So they're a really good insect group um, to start, you know, learning and going out into the into the parks and countryside and, and trying to identify identify them. They're a good group to start with um, compared to moths or beetles um, and flies where there are thousands. Um, so they're a really good kind of beginner uh, insect to, to get started with. Um, they also pollinate. So butterflies are pollinators as well. Um, you can see that for example, the, the large white, which is the one feeding on thistle, just uh, the top left hand side, um, you can see it's proboscis. So they're taking nectar and they are pollinators. Um, Butterflies also are food for other wildlife as well. Um, so like a lot of insects, um, they are prey for birds, uh, mammals and lots of uh, lots of animals. So, you know, it, uh, butterflies provide a good meal. Um, butterflies are also indicators of a biodiverse habitat. So um, if you've got lots of butterfly species in a given habitat, so say um, a woodland in, in South London. If you record, you know, a good variety, maybe 10 different species of butterfly, that's normally a good indicator um, that, that that habitat is supporting other invertebrate species and therefore other, you know, maybe birds and mammals uh, and, and reptiles and things like that. So if you've got a lot of butterflies in one habitat, then often um, you've got a biodiverse uh, habitat. Um, butterflies are one of the most studied animals in the world, um, mainly due to their beauty and popularity. Um, I think lots of people have kind of fond memories of a summer's day, you know, chasing butterflies. Um, and actually in, in, in Britain, we have kind of in the UK, we have a kind of obsession with um, recording butterflies. Um, so we've got really good data sets and they act as a model organism for science. And I'm going to talk a bit about that in terms of the indicators of them. Um, uh, indicators of, of a changing climate. Also, butterflies provide important roles in ecotourism. So lots of people travel globally uh, to search for butterflies. Um, I'm going to touch on the monarch butterfly, which is a really famous butterfly that migrates um, that can be found in the Americas. And, and um, lots of people travel specifically to see that butterfly. So butterflies are also responsible for um, helping um, economies for ecotourism. OK, now I hope that you can watch this video. Laura, maybe if I if I play this video, can you let me know if you can watch it? I'm going to start with um, sure. 
just just showing the butterflies. Uh, so these are not UK species. That's what I'm going to start with. So these are not butterfly species going to find in the UK, but I couldn't resist it because as much as I want to talk about butterflies in the UK and what you're likely to see, um, you know, there's there's butterflies from around the world that are stunning. Um, and um, I just wanted to kind of show the diversity of them. Um, so I'm going to play this video. I hope people can watch this at home. Can see it, sorry, at home. Is that working, Laura? Yeah, it's moving. There's, I can't hear any sound. That's all right. There isn't. There isn't any sound. Yeah. yeah. So we this is moving. this is to show the kind of amazing blue iridescence of butterflies. Um, so this was filmed in in Costa Rica, and this is a, a blue morpho butterfly. Um, so you can see how beautiful and iridescent they are. My filming is um, all over the place, but it just shows that you know, yes some butterflies in the UK may be quite small, but actually we have huge butterflies in tropical parts of the world and you can just see their variety. We've got butterflies that have eye spots here. We've got butterflies that have complete that have basically transparent wings. This is a glass wing butterfly. Um, and then we've got chrysalises. So um, I'm going to touch on their life cycle. Bright golden, you know, so just wanted to show the variety um, and this kind of amazing blue iridescence of butterflies. Um, and yeah, these are all found in the tropics. But just to kind of touch on how amazing butterflies are and their beauty. So we're going to start with the life cycle of a butterfly. Um, I'm sure lots of you know this um, and, you know, I feel like this is something that we we all learn at school from a really young age. Um, and I think everyone's read The Very Hungry Caterpillar. So we all know, you know, the life cycle of a butterfly, but actually the intricate details of, of how this life cycle happens is fascinating. And lots of insects use a life cycle like this um, where an adult will lay an egg and then there's a larval stage. Um, I'm just going to admit some people in. Um, but sorry, um, I should have so, it, May. no, that's all right. Um, so so there's um, a larval stage and then there's a, a pupil stage and normally there's a kind of um, the, the, the larva will undergo metamorphosis to become an adult with wings. So lots of insects like beetles and flies use this mechanism. One reason why scientists think there might be a life cycle is so that the adult butterfly isn't competing with its own young. So, for example, the um, the adult butterfly or an adult beetle um, will either not feed at all or will feed on nectar. So they're not in, com on, in competition with their young. So, for example, the larva, which might be feeding on um, leaves or dead wood. Um, so it's basically a way of not having to compete with your own young. Um, so for, for, first of all, mating, you can see this beautiful photo of these of these two butterflies mating here. Um, so visual and chemical cues help butterflies find their own species um, and often butterflies engage in courtship dances. Um, these are really, really a brilliant kind of courtship dances um, and it's similar to the animal kingdom. You know, it's, you see birds that do this kind of beautiful courtship dance um, and an, an example is the male wood white butterfly um, which lands opposite a female and he kind of waves his head and antenna backwards and forwards with his proboscis extended. So the proboscis is kind of almost the, the straw-like um, structure that that um, butterflies use to feed from um, and and they do this amazing dance it's worth if you've got if you ever find time to um, to google a wood white male um, doing doing his uh, courtship dance and it's it's really worth doing because they have this kind of beautiful um, dance that they do do with their antenna and it's really stunning to watch so there is um, you know love at first sight with butterflies um, so when the uh, when the male and female have mated, the the females will go in search of the correct caterpillar food plant. So caterpillars are really picky. I'm going to touch on that in just a moment um, about what they eat. So often you see female butterflies kind of hovering above leaves, checking if it's the right food plant, and then the the female will actually kind of curb her abdomen underneath, um, often underneath the leaf. Um, I hope you can you can see that here. You can see that this um, this large white butterfly is actually laying an egg and her abdomen is slightly curled and there's a very very small yellow egg that she's laying there and sometimes butterflies will lay one singular egg um, or they might lay in batches um, so it, it really varies from species to species so this is the same butterfly and you can see that that her abdomen is kind of curved underneath um, and and as you probably know this this butterfly so they're often called kind of cabbage white 
butterflies um, that, that lay their eggs on brassica and the and nasturtium as well. Um, I wanted to mention as well with, with egg laying, um, a butterfly that used to be extinct in the UK, but through successful reintroductions can now be found in, in um, nature reserves. Uh, one of them, uh, th this photograph I took in, in Gloucestershire, um, so this is a female large blue butterfly um, and she lays the, the uh, eggs on wild thyme um, and the caterpillar will hatch and feed on the flower heads and seeds. So you can see that she's got this quite distinct curve in her abdomen. She's laying an egg um, and once the caterpillar grows, it will drop to the ground um, and it releases this, releases this kind of honey like secretion um, that gets picked up by um, red ants that are living in the anthills in this habitat. Um, and they basically pick up this caterpillar because the secretion almost that makes tricks them into thinking that this is actually one of their own young and they take the caterpillar back into their nest um, and, and this caterpillar is protected and looked after as if it was um, you know the, the ant's own young and then that caterpillar will will undergo metamorphosis and pupae inside that that ant's nest so it's protected inside this amazing nest and then it will um, as it emerges the, the butterfly will kind of crawl out of um, of the ant nest and it's absolutely fascinating and, and you know these are the kind of amazing uh, intricate relationships that um, insects have with one another um, and it's it's really brilliant that, that the large blue you can actually now see um, back in the UK again. OK, so once the female has laid her eggs, you can see that their eggs come in so many different shapes and sizes. So this one, um, I think this is a Red Admiral egg on nettle. Um, and you can see it's just one singular egg um, and it's very, very well camouflaged. Compare that to the um, eggs that are laid in batches. I think this is a large white um, that, that laid these eggs. They're very um, kind of symmetrical, bright yellow. And actually, you can see all of these little things are tiny, tiny caterpillars that have just emerged. So you can see there's a real difference. I mean, there's so many different uh, egg shapes. Some are almost kind of biconcave and, and kind of a bright white colour. Um, others are um, similar kind of orange or yellow. So really, really, there's, there's a lot of variety. So once the caterpillars hatch from the eggs, their first, uh, their kind of, their first meal is the egg itself. Um, so you can, if I go back, actually, um, let me see if I can go back. Oh no, that's forward. Can I go back? Um, so you can see that um, there are still some caterpillars awaiting, uh, not quite emerged yet from these eggs. But all of these caterpillars around here will have eaten the egg. Uh, case that they came out of um, and this is very this very normal you know it makes sense why waste that protein rich meal um, and as caterpillars reach maturity um, their sexual organs will grow internally but the sex is not visible from the exterior um, I did a, a did a talk to a primary school a couple of years ago um, and I had um, it was a year four class and I had a pupil um, put up their hand and ask you know is is a caterpillar a, a man or a woman, a male or a female? Um, and I think I just thought that was such a brilliant question because I'd never thought about it. I just thought a caterpillar is is a caterpillar. But actually, it's really interesting because you can only really tell the um, the sex of a butterfly once they're an adult. Um, caterpillars are really picky when it comes to their food plant, um, so they often only eat kind of one or or two, um, sometimes several, but in general, they're, they're quite picky and will only eat one food plant, hence why the female has quite a hard job of flying around trying to pick the right one. And if if they can't, if, if the caterpillar doesn't find the right food plant that it's happy with, it just won't eat and, and dies. So they really are kind of, uh, they really are picky eaters um, and they adapt many tactics to evade their prey so you can see these caterpillars here um, these black caterpillars are caterpillars of the peacock butterfly and you can see immediately they're really spiky um, same with the small tortoise shell caterpillars this is a comma caterpillar as well all spiky um, and actually some of them are camouflaged as well um, and they often 
you can see here there's kind of some other caterpillars in the background um, they often eat together um, and safety in numbers or they create um, so caterpillars produce silk so they can also create kind of tents made out of silk and again that's safety in numbers so they really have a, a good way of evading predators because lots of birds feed on caterpillars so caterpillars are also a really important part of bird uh, and mammal diets and reptile diets, I should say. So I mentioned camouflage of caterpillars. So this is a caterpillar here. Um, again, this one is not found in the UK. This is the caterpillar of a swallowtail butterfly. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys, um, it might not come straight to your head, but for me, um, it looks like bird droppings and that's exactly what the caterpillar wants you to think that it's kind of a slimy bit of bird poo and it's nothing there's nothing to see nothing edible here um so really amazing that that caterpillars um evolved to have this camouflage um this also this caterpillar here you can see it's in the central stem of this banana uh, banana plant leaf. So this is a caterpillar here of the owl butterfly and it is so well camouflaged. It's actually even kind of th this patch on on in the middle of its body mimics kind of, you know, the these um, these damages in the leaf. And it's so slender as well. It just perfectly blends in with the leaf. Um, and so the adult also has camouflage using these eye spots, hence the name owl butterfly, because it's meant to look like an owl. Um, and these butterflies are big and um, when they show both their wings, these two eye spots look exactly like a huge bird's eye. Uh, and if, if I was a predator, I would definitely be put off trying to catch that to eat. So just to kind of show you again, so we've got a, a batch of eggs here that the female will lay. They emerge as caterpillars. Um, so this, these caterpillars of the large white butterfly, this might be a common sighting for lots of gardeners out there that, that probably get frustrated with caterpillars eating their nasturtiums. I'm probably the only weirdo in London that plants plants just to be eaten by caterpillars. That's how much I love them. Um, <coughs> so they eat. They eat and eat and eat. Caterpillars are total eating machines and they grow and grow and grow. Um, and actually um, they molt, they shed their skin um, in order to, to grow um, because they, they have to in order to gain all that energy to undergo metamorphosis. So these caterpillars have eaten a lot and they become these huge large caterpillars here. And you've probably guessed it, these little things around uh, are caterpillar poo. They poo a lot because they eat a lot. So once the caterpillar um, is ready to, to pupate, so depending on on what the conditions are like, which I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on a bit in terms of the um, butterflies being indicated to climate change, because the, the kind of conditions have to have to be right for the caterpillars to um, to undergo metamorphosis. Um, when caterpillars are ready to pupate, they'll go in search for the right spot. So, for example, with with this, um, I believe this is a, a peacock chrysalis. What I should have said at the start, which I didn't. Sorry, everyone. Uh, I'm not a butterfly expert. I'm an enthusiast. So if I do get things wrong, please, please let me know. Because, um, uh, you know, there's 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 a few different species. So if I get anything muddled, let me know. I'm always, always, uh, always need to be learning. Um, so I believe this is a peacock chrysalis and you can see here that the caterpillar has chosen to pupate underneath a leaf so it's it's shelter that's exactly what what um you know what they need during this really vulnerable period of their life cycle the same with this um this pupa here so this is a stem of a nettle um quite quite low down this was in um uh barnes wetland center and so you can see that they've the caterpillar attaches itself using silk and it hangs um these these pupae here are not UK species. These are actually taken in a in a butterfly house. Um, so I'm sure many of you um, here this evening have, have been to a kind of tropical butterfly house. There's one at the Natural History Museum or in Stratford upon Avon or um, at the Horniman Museum. And often there's a puparium. So you can actually see all of these pupae um, in it, it, um, kind of glued onto these sticks. But normally caterpillars will use their natural glue, which is silk. Um, and um, yeah, so some caterpillars will attach themselves to a plant stem or leaf by spinning silk. Um, others simply drop down and just pupate in the leaf litter um, on the ground. Um, and 
really amazingly, I'm going to go to the next slide because with the pupa, you can actually see the 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 body parts of the butterfly. So hopefully you can see this, but you can actually see the butterfly's eye here. And this will be um, often you can see the antenna along here and this is the wing. You can kind of see the wing forming here. Um, and it's really amazing that you can actually see once the um, once normally when the butterfly is ready to emerge, you can really see the butterfly almost becomes like a see through window. and You can see the butterfly. I'm just going to go back to the previous slide. So. Um, metamorphosis is absolutely fascinating and really for me this is kind of the biggest wonders of, of the world. I mean how does a caterpillar you know turn into basically it goes from an eating machine that isn't really that mobile to becoming a butterfly with wings that can fly hundreds of miles. It's amazing. Um, and I must admit, when I was young, um, I used to find caterpillars in my garden and I used to rear them in a, in a little box that I used to keep keep them in. It was a little kind of old, old um, uh, um, ice cream tub. And I remember once I was absolutely devastated, but I accidentally squashed a chrysalis and all that came out of it was this weird gloop. And to me, I just thought, surely that, you know, how on earth does 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 that eventually turn into a butterfly? And so scientists use this this term genetic soup. So essentially, when the caterpillar um, uh, undergoes its final molt, it sheds its skin and creates almost it puts on essentially a new a new suit, uh, a new sleeping bag, um, and it, it essentially kind of um, dissolves itself. So the building blocks of, um, you know, all of the proteins, the building blocks of that caterpillar um, essentially are kind of um, melted down, mixed up, and um, all of the different body parts are kind of reorganized. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and even scientists today really don't know exactly how it works. Um, and so during the process of metamorphosis, um, the wings are fully formed, the chewing mouth parts of the caterpillar turn into the sucking proboscis of the adult butterfly. So that's the straw like proboscis that you see, um, you know, going in, going into um, going into flowers to drink nectar. Um, and lots of insects undergo metamorphosis. But why have a life cycle at all? And that's kind of what I touched on earlier, is that you can get this division, um, almost, you know, division of um, of food and that means that the adult butterfly isn't competing with its young. Great, so this is the pupa, you can see the eye there. So when the adults emerge, um, they're really vulnerable um, and it takes a while for them to dry out their wings um, and to be able to fly. What's really interesting about adult butterflies is that some of them are what we call sexually dimorphic, which means that the adult female looks very different to the adult male. Um, and it's really interesting because when I'm out and about and talking to people about butterflies, um, you know, for example, these orange tip butterflies, if you see them next to each other, people say, but they look completely different. They they look like completely different species. Um, and other other butterflies, you would never be able to tell the difference between a female and a male. So it's really interesting for me to, to look to look at um, you know, some species that look completely different. So you can see here the male of the orange tip um has orange tipped wings um whereas the female has black tipped wings they still have this really amazing kind of camouflage pattern here um the common blue butterfly so the, these butterflies you can you can see in london quite easily um so th this common blue butterfly the female is this beautiful brown color and you can see these kind of iridescent blue um blue colors coming through um and this kind of or, uh, orange diamonds around the edge of their wings whereas the male is blue and just completely blue through and through they look completely different and then actually when they have their wings closed they look very similar. So it's only when the butterfly opens its wings um, that, that you can really kind of, um, that you can really tell the difference between male and female. Um, and butterflies 
I'm going to go through now. Um, oh, actually, I'll, I'll mention that the butterfly migra migration and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what butterflies you can find across London. Um, so I, I can't do a talk about butterflies without mentioning their, their migration because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so like many, many species, butterflies migrate. Um, and some of you might already know that the, um, these two example species of, of migration. So this big image on the right hand side is the painted lady. Um, the painted lady migrates from um, North Africa up to mainland Europe and into Britain and they fly over the channel and it is absolutely amazing and they do this across generations um, so the adult butterflies will fly say from northern Africa into Spain um, and then might lay eggs and then the life cycle happens and those adults that emerge in Spain will then fly fly further north and that keeps that keeps happening across generations eventually the painted lady will arrive into Britain and, and you know up into Scotland um, and it's really 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 fascinating fascinating because butterflies can navigate. They're really strong flyers. Um, lots of people think butterflies, you know, are, are um, you live 24 hours or, you know, are, are, are really fragile. And of course they are fragile, but they're also really robust flyers um, and, and their navigation skills are amazing. Um, on the left hand side, I've got the monarch butterfly. Um, the monarch butterfly is another really brilliant example of migration um, and, and often, you know, um, used in kind of, uh, you know, textbooks and adverts and lots of things like that. It's quite a quite a popular butterfly globally to, to use um, for, you know, educational reasons and that kind of thing. And so the monarch butterfly um, does this 3000 mile journey um, between North America and then the forests in southern Mexico, again, across generations. So that 3000 3, mile round trip journey, um, they do again across generations so the adults will fly south towards Mexico the life cycle continues and, and when the adults emerge they fly further south until they reach um, these fir forests in southern Mexico and you can see here just the sheer number of butterflies that are on one tree really sadly the monarch butterfly is in decline um, due to habitat loss um, you know, really sadly, you know, the, these these um, these forests are um, subject to illegal logging um, and also the butterfly feeds on a plant called milkweed um, and, uh, you know, just really encouraging people in 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 um, areas where this butterfly can be found to plant milkweed for the caterpillars. Um, and unfortunately, it is a trend that we're seeing lots of butterflies in decline, which I'll touch on later on. But their migration is absolutely fascinating. Their navigation. Um, is is just really brilliant. OK, so now on to butterflies that you can find in London. And I know some of you, when you signed up, you asked about what butterflies can I find in my garden in, in London? Um, these are the kind of butterflies that you'll see around gardens and parks in London. And um, this isn't all of them. Um, I don't have time to go through them all, but these are just kind of the, j just some of them that you're likely to see. So we've got the comma butterfly, the small tortoise shell and the peacock. Now, all of these butterflies are butterflies that hibernate and they emerge um, often kind of February and March. If there's a warm day, you see them flying around. Um, or often people will send me a picture of one of these butterflies in their shed um, thinking it's dead um, and like, oh my goodness, I've seen this butterfly. I think it's dead. What's it doing? Um, and actually it's just, it's just found a sheltered spot in your shed and it's hibernating and it will emerge when the time is right. Um, and these butterflies are quite big butterflies um, and they have really amazing camouflage. Again, I can't quite do all of the, um, uh, include all of the images but um, when they close their wings you can kind of see it on this small tortoiseshell here they've got really dark undersides and they basically look mi they mimic dead leaves um, so it's it's really fascinating again that use of camouflage to evade predators and to hide um, peacocks are one of my favorite butterflies they use these eye spots similar to the owl butterfly that I showed you that um, that I photographed in in Central America and they use these eye spots and it's just amazing that eye spots um, have have been you know have evolved and, and used in so many butterfly species a, a, across the globe um, and you know maybe perhaps looking a bit like um, a bit like a snake lots of um, you know lots of predators will be put off by that let me just check the time brilliant so these species as well you're likely to see in London so what's really amazing about butterflies is that 
the more you go out and look for them, the more you realise they have different personalities. They have different ways of flying. They have preferences. So some might come out in the evening. Some you might see all the time. Some might, you know, not mind if it's raining. You might still see them flying. So um, I don't have time to go into that today, but it's just really fascinating. The more you're out in the field um, observing these butterflies, the more you notice, ah, I'm pretty sure, for example, that's a holly blue. This is a holly blue, um, even though you might have only seen as kind of silvery glimpse because they they like to fly around holly um, and ivy and they fly quite high up as well in the bushes. And this is quite a common butterfly across London. Um, you'll notice as well with butterflies that you often give up because you've you're trying to chase them around looking like a lunatic, which is often what I do running around. People no idea what I'm doing, waiting for this butterfly to land. It never does. And it's really frustrating because you can't get up close to see them. Um, so, you know, it's worth mentioning all of these beautiful images, um, but often when you're out, it's really hard to spot them. So that's how you learn actually from their flight, their flight behavior, <coughs> their flight patterns. Sorry, I'm just going to take a sip of water. Oh, dear. Oh, my colleague had this problem last week when he was doing his winter warmer talk. So I think it must just be because <clears throat> I'm talking so much. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So the holly blue butterfly, beautiful silver colour and it's absolutely stunning. Compare that to the common blue, um, which is another butterfly that you can see in London on a really hot day in meadows. Um, this blue butterfly can be seen flying quite low in the vegetation, which is very different to the holly blue, which likes to fly a bit higher up. So that's normally the way to distinguish them. <clears throat> and you can also see here in the common blue, these beautiful kind of orange um, diamonds on the outside. We touched on this butterfly that was sexually dimorphic just a moment ago. Um, we've got this butterfly as well, small copper. Um, again, a beautiful little butterfly that you can see in London. This one, unfortunately, is not quite as common, um, but but you can see it in one of our rural parks in Greenwich. I've spotted it there and in Bushy Park as well. Um, so they're really stunning little butterflies and Regent's Park uh, as well, actually. So you can see these in, in across our rural parks. Um, now the purple hair streak. You're probably looking at it thinking, why on earth is it called a purple hair streak? May I can't see any purple on it at all. Well, actually, when it opens its wings, um, it has these beautiful kind of purple iridescence um, uh, that you can see in its wings. When the wings are closed, it's more of a silver colour. Um, and the purple hair streak, again, is a really fascinating butterfly because these butterflies actually really, they are quite common and widespread across London, but they're really hard to see because they often fly high up in the trees. So the purple hair streak lays its egg on oak, um, often on in between the the, um, the buds of an, of an oak tree. And they like to kind of congregate in what we call the champion oak um, uh, and, and normally in the evenings um, and one of um, one of our my good friends who's who's a volunteer at the charity called Butterfly Conservation which I'll touch on towards the end of this presentation um, has been monitoring butterflies in Wandsworth Common for a very very long time and he's actually noticed and observed these purple hair streak butterflies congregating at kind of this champion oak tree, which is the biggest one. Um, and he sees them flying up high. And it's a little bit like a butterfly nightclub because it's the female and, and male butterflies kind of sussing out who they want to who they want to mate with, who could be a prospective partner. Um, so these butterflies, again, are quite hard to see because they often fly quite high up. They do come down to the ground to take nectar. Um, there's one butterfly actually that is 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 quite rare in, in the UK called the Purple Emperor that actually normally flies up high as well in oak trees, but comes down um, and feeds on, um, actually feeds from feces. Um, so often you can see people luring them down with um, horse poo and things like that. So butterflies might look beautiful, but sometimes they 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 uh, yeah they what they eat is is not quite as beautiful. Okay, 
some more species that you might see in London. Um, so we've got this gatekeeper butterfly. So these are um, kind of a, a meadow species. They love feeding on bramble, flowers and marjoram. And you can see this one here on ragwa as well. Um, so these are a really, really beautiful butterfly that again, you can see across London. Um, we've then got the speckled wood butterfly. Now these butterflies are fascinating because they're quite, the, the males can be really territorial. And the speckled wood can often be found um, in more woodland areas. So areas where there's a lot of shade um, and the speckled woods kind of hunt out the part where sunshine is just shining through and there's a small sunny patch and you often find speckled woods there um, and again you know when they're flying they look very similar to the brown gatekeeper or another butterfly called a meadow brown um, but you can you can really tell the difference because speckled woods are often the ones that you'll see in more of a shady woodland edge um, habitat whereas gatekeepers and meadow browns are often in kind of open meadow and grassland um, we've then got the skipper butterflies. Um, these are really amazing butterflies because um, not only do they fly really erratically, um, I mean, they're a bit like, um, you know, like a hummingbird in that sense. They fly so quickly um, and they're really, they, they can be so difficult to, to keep an eye on, you know, as you're kind of, your head's moving like this a bit like when you're watching tennis, just going back and forth, back and forth. You can't quite see where the butterfly, where the butterfly is. So when they land, um, you've got to really make the most of it. And actually these butterflies are fascinating because they hold their wings in a really strange position. So you can see that this butterfly holds its wings at kind of a 90 degree angle. Um, and the small skipper here that you can see on the right, you can see a really nice example of the proboscis here going into the flower, taking nectar. Um, and their kind of big eyes are really noticeable. Um, and they're, they're really, really fascinating butterflies. There's quite a few different skipper species. Um, so it's, it's worth having, having a research afterwards. Um, there's one called the dingy skipper and the grizzled skipper. Um, they've all got really, really wonderful names. So these butterflies are quite often mistaken for moths because they fly quite low to the ground and they have that similar flight like a moth that's quite erratic. Um, and then we've also got other butterflies that you'll see in London. Um, so we've got the green veined white, um, aptly named. You can see that there's kind of these beautiful green colours um, on its wings and you can really see the, the veins marked out clearly. Um, so look out for this if the butterfly lands. Um, you can see that the green veins are quite clearly marked out. Compare that to a butterfly like the small white here um, that's much more yellow and doesn't have this kind of green dusting on its wings. Um, then we've got the orange tip, which I mentioned earlier, again, as, a, as an example of a butterfly that's sexually dimorphic. So these orange tip wings you can spot from you know quite far away so they're a really distinctive butterfly um, and actually these butterflies are one of the first that you can see in the year um, this orange tip butterfly um, I took this photograph in a park um, in East London um, and you can see it's feeding on beautiful little bluebells here so this is a really nice butterfly to, to spot um, kind of from April time. We've also got this butterfly, the marbled white, which really can't be mistaken for any other butterfly. Um, it's got this beautiful, beautiful marble colour, uh, marble pattern, sorry, to its wings. It's black and white, checkered. It's absolutely stunning. And um, we've got loads of these in Brompton Cemetery, one of our rural parks. So it's really worth going um, kind of peak peak season, kind of July. You see these butterflies in Brompton Cemetery um, and, and across London. And they are really, really beautiful. They, they can't really be mistaken for anything else. So they're a good one if you spot it. Um, it's a good one to to show off about because you're pretty confident you're right because it can't be yeah mistaken for anything else really really beautiful butterfly found um in kind of yeah in in grassland areas and, and meadows so butterflies are the perfect engagement tool because for numerous reasons and part of my job at the Royal Parks um, and the team that I work in is engaging people in the wonderful world of insects. Now often it's quite difficult to convince people to love wasps for example uh, because lots of people's experience of a wasp is you know a, a kind of irritating buzz at a picnic um, despite how important wasps are but what I normally do is talk to people about butterflies because in general there are people that are scared of butterflies sometimes you find that but in general people like them they have fond memories of them so what I normally do is kind of draw people in um, talking about butterflies um, and then talk and then use that as a tool to then talk about perhaps other things they might not like as much, such as, you know, mosquitoes, flies and, and wasps. Once I've got them, once I've got you captive at an engagement event, um, you know, I'll be talking about loads of different animals. Um, butterflies, you can get up close to them uh, when they decide to land, um, but 
that's what a net is for. So um, we had this, you can see this photograph of a wonderful family that came to one of our engagement events in Regents. And you can use a net um, to, to, to catch butterflies, um, to look at them up close and then and then release them. So you can get up close to, to butterflies and it's really amazing, you know, sometimes on a hot day, they're, they're landing, they're resting, and you can see the kind of intricate, you know, their, their, their eyes and their proboscis and all of the different parts of the butterfly. And you don't need specialist equipment to see butterflies either. Um, they can be found in parks and gardens. You do, don't need to travel far. There are some specialist species that are found only in specific habitats that you might need to travel to. But there are, you know, we've got over 20 species in London um, and you just need to, you know, go, go to your local park and you'll definitely see one. Um, no need to visit a tropical butterfly house. Um, I mean, th th this is often often what happens is that people forget we actually have wild butterflies. Um, so you don't have to visit a tropical butterfly house to see them. Um, and they're relatively easy to identify compared to other insect groups and they don't sting or bite, which is always quite useful because this is this is the thing, you know, with trying to convince people that wasps are really important, um, you know, well, actually people just think, well, they're going to they might sting me. I want no wasps on this planet at all, um, which which would be a mistake. But I can see why people would be fearful of them. Um, this is a mural that's um, that went up last April in Regent's Park, um, and these are th this is a mural done by um, Karen Francesca and, and the artist ATM, who's done lots of work across London. Um, and these kind of showcase all the species that you can find in in Regent's Park. So you know, butterflies are. Um, you know, brightly coloured and and often just such such a great way to engage people in the wildlife. So the next thing I want to talk about is so I mentioned why a butterfly is important. Well, they're key indicators of a changing climate um, and of habitat loss. They're very, very sensitive to, um, you know, to, to changes. And one of the things that we we have at the Royal Parks are a brilliant group of volunteers that do um, that walk what we call a transect, which is a designated route once a week in a given green space. Um, and this uh, example that I'm using here is of Brompton Cemetery. And you can see that there's a route here around the cemetery with different points and volunteers mark which species of butterfly they see at which point. Um, and this can build up a long term data set to see how populations are faring and informs management of our parks and the wider countryside. Um, and anyone can be a scientist. You know, you don't have to have gone to university or have a PhD. Actually, science is all about collecting data um, and trying to, to make a conclusion from that. And so citizen scientists are so valuable and we have so many brilliant citizen scientists across the UK um, that enable us to create um, diagrams such as this one which is taken from the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme website which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, so you can see this map here um, essentially the, these dots represent kind of the, the abundance of um, species uh, sorry of, of individual butterflies that have been recorded across time um, and so you can see you know around London and the south there's there's you know relatively good populations and then as you go up north when it where it gets a bit colder perhaps a bit more mountainous up in Scotland um they're not they're not found um as much but what is really amazing about I'm just gonna go to the oh no hang on not that one um what's really amazing about butterflies is that we have got really really good data sets going back to around the 70s so they are really really important in kind of indicating a changing climate now i also want to touch on camouflage so butterflies are amazing at camouflage which i have touched on already um but but one of the things that i just wanted to mention i think my my slides seem to have gone quite in the wrong place i'm sorry so this one should have been a bit earlier um but I think what's fascinating about butterflies is their camouflage. Now, the eagle-eyed of you might have noticed that there is a butterfly here. Now, this butterfly is the brimstone butterfly. Again, a, a butterfly that hibernates um, and actually can live for up to 10 months. Um, and this is a butterfly that you might see, you know, at the start of the year on that warm, that first warm day that really makes you think, finally, 
spring and summer is coming. So you can see this butterfly essentially mimics a leaf. It's so hard to see. Then you've got caterpillars that camouflage as well um, with their surroundings and the chrysalis too. You can see that this chrysalis, you would really find it hard to spot that because it's such a perfect green colour to, to match the colour of the leaf. And actually you can see here the silk that has been used by the caterpillar to actually um, kind of hook and attach itself to the leaf. It's it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, and that is also a reminder, you know, where, where does silk come from? Well, it comes from from caterpillars that that spin um that spin their cocoons. So the, the silk moth. Um, really amazing to to think that, you know, garments that we wear comes from stuff that caterpillars have spun for us. Um, and I mentioned eye spots. Um, so this is a again, these butterflies are found in the tropics, but I mentioned the peacock butterfly that has eye spots. So this butterfly here, um, you can see it's got these really amazing kind of dark eye spots and these lines here that kind of draw your eye to it and will draw a predator's eye to it. And the same with this owl butterfly here. Again, eye spot here, a little one up there as well. And so they really are striking. And so um, butterflies, at all stages of the life cycle, in, you know, the caterpillar and um, a, a, and the adult use camouflage in order to survive. And it really is all about survival. So I talked about citizen scientists being able to gather data for us um, about how butterfly populations are faring in the UK. Um, and unfortunately, butterflies are in decline, not all species but many, many species are in decline. And unfortunately, this is a global trend um, that insects are facing. Um, so butterflies have short life cycles in general, um, kind of, you know, a few months to a year and are therefore sensitive to changes in the environment. They're also found across all habitats. So you find butterflies, um, you know, in chalk grassland, in woodland areas, in parks and gardens. Um, and so they're really key for indicating how our landscape might be changing. Um, and unfortunately, butterflies are in decline for a few different reasons. So reasons such as climate change, habitat loss, um, and also habitat fragmentation. Um, so, for example, you might notice, um, you know, that there are there was, you know, maybe, um, you know, 50 to 100 years ago, one large woodland. And actually there's, you know, a road's been put through it, maybe a housing development's been built um, at one side of it. And actually those butterflies have to fly quite a distance now to be able to travel from one part of the woodland to the next. Um, and butterflies don't always, you know, aren't always able to or, or want to fly that far. Um, land use change as well. Um, so, you know, in, in um, intensive farming, for example, um, and increased use of pesticides. So all of these um, changes are, um, uh, you know, maybe the reason why butterflies and many insects are in decline. Um, particularly what's worrying is that, so lots of butterflies are specialists. So they're found at very specific um, habitats, for example, the large blue butterfly that I mentioned that has a really intricate life cycle with a particular species of ant. Um, you know, they like really sunny chalk grassland spots. So they're quite specialist. Therefore, they are, you know, um, due to, you know, um, as because they're specialists, they are um, more vulnerable. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, to changes, environmental changes. But even widespread generalist species like cabbage whites, for example, these butterflies that you can kind of see anywhere and everywhere, even these ones are declining. And that's what is, of, you know, is of the concern. Um, and butterflies are the best studied UK insects by far. Um, and, and we have data going back to the 1970s. Um, and they can act as a model organism for climate change. And in general, globally, butterflies are well studied. So they are, um, we can kind of look to them and look to their population changing, um, because if butterflies are in decline, it's likely um, that many, many other species will be in decline. For example, if butterfly species have been lost in one habitat, that's an, an indicator that many other species have probably gone extinct in, in that area as well. Um, now, someone mentioned, um, uh, in fact, a few of you mentioned when you signed up to this talk about climate change having a good or bad impact on butterfly species. Um, and, and what's really interesting is that climate change um, is, is proving, you know, 
very challenging for some butterflies um, and particularly those butterflies that are already in cold environments so for example in, in the north so in Scotland um, due to kind of drier conditions perhaps their um, the, 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 the caterpillar food plant is not as abundant um, and it's getting warmer and therefore you know one, once you're kind of past Scotland well you've got the you've got the sea so there isn't really anywhere further north for them to go however some butterflies um, that are, you know perhaps Scotland and the north was too cold um, actually now they are moving further north so they're actually expanding their range and that's really interesting that, that some species are benefiting but on the whole um, the changes, you know, climate change is happening at a really fast rate and and, and overall, you know, it, they, they are having um, negative impacts. Um, and what, what's interesting as well, I'm just checking my notes just to make sure I've covered everything. So what's also interesting is that with some butterflies, um, pre predominantly those butterflies that emerge in spring, they have uh, they have to find their caterpillar food plant. And so some butterflies are emerging early. Um, so, for example, a couple of years ago, we had a really hot few days in February um, in London and probably in, in the south and southeast, southwest, um, and loads of butterflies emerged. Um, but actually, the, um, the, the caterpillar food plant, um, the plant hadn't matured. So those butterflies were mating, but they had nowhere to lay their eggs. And this is the problem is that lots of insects are emerging um, earlier and actually are now out of sync with the with the plants that they would normally be laying their eggs eggs on and this is a big issue with climate change with changing weather patterns and, and unpredictable weather um, the these kind of um, once perfectly synchronized and balanced um, you know relationships between between um, plants and insects um, you know that, that have been exist have been in existence for millennia and now being changed um, and that is really what is concerning um, so I just wanted to highlight this stat as well so the state of the UK's butterflies 2015 report so this can be found you can download this on the butterfly conservation website um, found that 76 percent of the UK's resident and regular migrant butterflies have either declined in abundance occurrence or both over the last four decades so that's just 40 years that's a 76% decline, two thirds. So it really is worrying. And the other thing I just wanted to draw your attention to is what we call the shifting baseline syndrome. Um, so gosh, I'm aware it's 7.30, I'm just, I'm almost finished. Um, so the shifting baseline syndrome um, is, is something of a, of, a, of a phenomena, recent phenomena where, for example, um, so my dad, who's in his early 70s, when he was my age, um, in his late 20s, you know, going off walking around in, in fields in the countryside in Kent, um, he would have seen loads of butterflies. You know, there would have been clouds of butterflies. If I go back to that same spot, actually, there might be, you know, it might be a road now. Um, you know, urbanisation might mean that that habitat's completely gone. Um, and I might actually only see a few butterflies. And so the issue is that the, that the new norm is changing. So for my generation, we might see, we might just be happy to see one butterfly. Um, and actually, we don't know that there used to be, you know, 50 or 100 butterflies butterflies in that population and therefore our shifting baseline syndrome means that we actually become content and this new norm is created um, and actually we don't know what used to be there and therefore you know we, we aren't able to really fight for for fight for what we've lost um, and and this is something that's really important and this is why we really need to start spreading the message about insects and butterflies being in decline so what can you do to help um, Donate to charities such as Butterfly Conservation and um, their logos down here. You can have a look at all of the wonderful work that they're doing um, and lots of other uh, like the wildlife trusts that do a lot of work to help butterflies. Um, volunteer your time, become a citizen scientist. You can do that through signing up to our volunteer page on the Royal Parks or having a look at the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. Um, you can join in with the Big Butterfly Count as well. That's an initiative that's started by Butterfly Conservation plant pollinator friendly plants. Please remember to plant plants for the adult butterflies to, to take nectar from, but also the caterpillar food plants. It's all, you have to remember all parts of the life cycle when trying to help butterflies. And please spread the word. This is probably the easiest thing. Spread the word about how important butterflies are um, and that they need our help. There's also some useful pollinator friendly plants and caterpillar food plants on here as well. 
okay sorry i feel i have um slightly out of time but thank you everyone for listening um and please do um if you have any questions um i'd love to hear them thank you so much may that was absolutely fantastic it was so interesting i've never heard or i don't think i've heard of shifting baseline syndrome before mm. that was that was really interesting um, guys, if you do want to pop any more questions in the chat, go for it. I'm just going to go through a couple that we've had in the chat already, May. Um, the first one was from Mark, and it's a really good one. Is is it known when butterflies first evolved and from what immediate ancestors? And he does realise that insects don't necessarily fossilise well. But mm. do we know? Yeah, insects, yeah insects don't really fossilise well. Um, uh, and do you know what? I actually really I don't know the answer to that, Mark. Um, so I am also fascinated to find out. I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. Um, so I think that's that's one that's one for both of us to go and research after this because I'm not entirely sure. But um, insects are in, incredibly, um, you know, uh, uh, have have been on this planet for you know hundreds millions of years. So um, yeah, I'm I'm really not sure, Mark. But that's a great question and one that I should I should find out. No worries. Maybe you know this one. The, the parasitic relationship between the large blue butterfly and the red ant has always intrigued Dan. Uh, do you know, are there any other butterfly species that parasitise other insects? Mm. I know that that's common across the particular um, family of blue butterflies. Um, so it's a family called Lysinidae, which actually features kind of the small copper and the hair streaks and the blues. But other than that, I'm not sure of any other examples. Um, if anyone on the call knows, then then please write them down. But I, I, I don't know of any other examples, certainly not in the UK anyway. No worries. Um, Di said that they enjoyed planting flowers with you at Brompton Cemetery, May. Oh, as well. that's nice. Yeah. Big shout out there. Yik Ting. Thank you, May and Laura. I'm just wondering, how do you tell um, if a butterfly is dead or just hibernating and sleeping? Which is a really good question because mm. I was also ties in with something I was thinking about, which is if the life cycle is quite short, mm. like how long do they actually live for? So how can yeah, some of them hibernate? Like, yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. How lazy so, are they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a really good question. Actually, some people submitted this question. Um, so, so actually, yeah. So, the, so the life cycle can kind of be actually almost up to a year. Um, and different species overwinter at a different stage in their life cycle. So, some will overwinter in a chrysalis. Some will overwinter um, as a caterpillar. Some will overwinter as an egg. And some species overwinter as the adult. Um, so they normally go into hibernation as it starts to get um, colder in kind of September um, and then will emerge at the yeah the first signs of kind of early spring in February. Um, the way to tell if a butterfly is dead, often if a butterfly is dead, um, it won't it won't be. Um, so so with butterflies, they'll often be kind of um, hanging from a wall. Um, if a butterfly is dead, normally its wings are incredibly, um, it kind of, they kind of go a bit hard. I know that sounds a bit strange, um, but they, they go, they go quite hard. The antenna also um, will not be kind of upright. Um, and often if you're worried that a butterfly is dead, if you just really gently put your finger underneath its body, um, often the legs will move um, and they, they'll they'll kind of very slowly move onto your finger. Um, whereas if the butterfly is dead and you try and go underneath underneath its body um, and uh, and its and its legs don't move, it will often be dead and it will just fall to the floor. Um, so that's normally a good indicator if they're if they're kind of if they're quite. Um, if they're quite hard and often the wings um, are really, really brittle. Um, brilliant. Thank you, mate. Brian's just asked, um, can you just show the last, the next to yeah. last slide again with the list of the plants to grow, please? That'd be really useful. Thank you. And then Jennifer just said, thanks so much for a great talk. They tuned in late. Can we watch it again? Yeah, we are recording it, Jennifer. So it will go on YouTube. Um, what we'll do is, um, I've put in the chat links so the page where you can donate if you have enjoyed May's talk. Uh, we'd be really grateful for any donations because, as we said at the beginning, the Royal Parks is a charity. Um, also in those links are the links to the next winter warmer talks. Um, the next one is on Monday the 21st and that's from um, Queerly Departed and it's about the um, LGBTQ plus community that are buried in Brompton Cemetery. So really interesting because um, we just wanted to celebrate as well. Like this month is 
Pride Month. Um, so we're tying that in with that. But May is also back again. Yay! Mm. On the 28th of February with um, all Marvellous Moths uh, is what May will be going through on the 28th of February as well. So links to those talks and where you can sign up to them are also in the chat and also linked to our upcoming events at the Royal Parks. Next week is half term and we do have free discovery days for families at the Lookout Centre in the middle of Hyde Park. Um, again, information can be found online. So if you want to go along to that, you don't necessarily have to have a family like with you, with children with you. you just go on your own, discover what's going on in Hyde Park that would be lovely um so yeah if anyone has any further questions do feel free to pop them in the chat otherwise i think we'll say good night and thank you so much for joining us and um, there's a few applauses going on as well for you there oh, May. thank you so thank you so much do feel free to show your love and appreciation for May. um that would be great and she does work at the royal park she is the our um, partnership and community engagement officer so if you have any other questions about that kind of work or butterflies in general, then of course, feel free to get in touch with her. Um, May, I don't know if you want to put your email in the chat as yes, well. Yes, yeah, if anyone has That'd any lovely. questions, I will put my email in the chat, yeah. So, we've had a few puns and jokes in the chat as well. Oh, really? Oh, that's good. Yes, yeah, sorry, my, um, I'm not very good <laughs> at coming up with puns. I wanted to post a joke about camouflage, but I couldn't find it. I love jokes like that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to ask and get in touch. Thank you. <laughs> Got a fan in the uh, in the crowd, May. <laughs> oh, definitely a massive asset to the Royal Park. So thank <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Feel free thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, and yeah, well. please, please do feel free to email me <laughs> with any questions and spread the word. Thank you so much for joining and taking your time out to learn about butterflies. Thank you.